Hello and welcome to another episode of Explore. Um, we are very happy to bring the fourth episode of Explore to you, Vignesh and I, uh, brought to you by Mopa Foundation. Um, in this episode, we'll be speaking about the music of Madurai Mani Iyer, who, for me personally, is one of the most special musicians um, to have um, graced this art form. Uh, he is someone who is, um, I think, kind of simplified into a box where uh, the moment you say Madhuramani Iyer, more often than not, people will tell you about his Sarvalagu singing, which was beautiful. The Swaram singing was beautiful. But his music, the more you kind of delve into it, the more there is to find. Because as a student of music, when you begin to uh, sing Kalpana Swaram, a uh, lot of people point you towards his recordings, but then the moment you have to venture into Neraval or Ragam or Tanam, his name does not come up often in terms of uh, um, recordings that are passed on to you. But there are a lot of other musicians whose Ragas, whose Neravals, whose Tanams, whose Pallavis will be given to you. So it's only after you've grown a certain uh, amount as a musician is when you, I think, revisit Madhuramaniya's music and kind of understand the various different layers of his music, which is what happened to me. Um, because there was a good period of four, five years, I think, when I also looked at Madhuramani Iyer through the um, very narrow tunnel of just Sarvalagu Kalpanaswaram singing. But the more I listened to him, the more I knew, the more I understood, the more I enjoyed the various different things that were so special about his music that I have learned a lot from where I would say that he probably has had the most impact in me in the last 4-5 years than any other musician, which was not the case before that. So I think that way to speak about him is a very special um, uh, thing for me to be doing. Yes, of course, even uh, for me, I when I was young, my father had two cassettes of uh, Madhur and uh, I mean, my Grandmother, I mean, I used to play those cassettes all the time. Uh, it had uh, the Pallavi Gana Lola Karuna Wala, the Parimala Rangapate, and also uh, Pamala in the Kundo, the song, and so many of his hits in those two cassettes that Appa had collected. And uh, we used to play that, I used to play that day, like full day, and my grandmother to a point where she used to get bored, me, please switch off that tape, you know, it's been going on all day. So, it's almost like memorize it. So, after that, there was a break for me and I, uh, I mean, um, like Ritwik said, everybody points us to different kind of recordings. Even my father, he knew, like, you know, Madhra Maniyars and uh, Kalpana Swarams go together, you know, Sarvalagu Swarams and it goes in a certain gate. And uh, beyond that, people don't think of him as much. And, uh, but later on, uh, when I came, moved to uh, Madras and... Uh, I was uh, given a lot of music by Ritwik and so many other friends and we started listening to Madhra Maniyar as a collective. I mean, we all used to listen together and, you know, point out Neravals and Swaram and Ragam and the way he uh, sang his Gamakas, the way he kind of um, envisioned the Ragam. So, that was beautiful and uh, like he said, after you reach a certain maturity in your music is when you start to realize these nuances in music. Not only of Madhra Maniyar, if you take any musician for that matter, after reaching a certain maturity in music, you start looking beyond a certain uh, aspect of music that they are known for and it starts revealing itself to you. So that's what happened with Madhra Maniyar and yes, it has had a big impact in the way I sing Swarams in the way I sing Ragam in the way I look at uh, Raga music itself right now. So, if we were to look at, say, certain basic uh, features that were constants in his music, the first thing that comes to my mind, actually two things, are Shruti Shuddham and Kala Pramana. Of course. Where anything he sang was always in pitch. Actually, the one most interesting story I love to say about Madhur Maniyar is a challenge that a senior musician gave me in conversation. We were, um, while travelling for a concert, we were actually having a conversation about multiple different things with respect to music and Kalpana Swaram Madhuramani Air was part of that discussion and he challenged me and said, you know, I've listened to a lot of Madhuramani Air recordings, I'm sure you also have. I challenge you to find one recording where he misses a Swaram, where he misses the ending or in the flow of singing a pattern, he there is a slight hesitancy which happens to all musicians. There is 
there are no exceptions to that but i can tell you that till today i haven't been able to find one which i am sure that there are if if suppose somebody was to listen to every minute of madhuram anir music available maybe they'll find one or two but the fact that you have to look that closely to be able to find even a slight blemish in that person's flow of music is i think phenomenal and i think the flow was so natural that that yielded itself to a certain kala pramanam where the kala pramanam was tight the flow can be that constant only if everything else around it like shruti the kala pramanam the confidence with which he sang were all uh, something that he had practiced so much that it became a part of him so that all he was doing at that point was thinking about the music and nothing else thinking about the raga and nothing else yeah his music was so open throated also uh, when you uh, look at his voice when you hear uh, his voice in any octave it may be let be the mandrasthai or the madhyasthai or the tarasthai um it was comp- it is he had a full voice you know he could modulate it in that full voice in whichever range he sang even uh, depending on the meaning of the lyrics depending on the movement of the raga depending on the context of the raga that he is singing and every it's not just sa pa sa and shruti every note every gamaka was in shruti in fact i've heard a story where uh, he was visiting uh, tn rajaratnam pillai and he told his students please he said the place ready shushruti varde shushruti varde he used to say yeah and uh, many of the times you will notice that he uses certain syllables very differently when he is singing ragam like for example you know we have this one obsession with indian classical music in general that open throated singing is only if you sing a ah. ah, right he is someone who completely demolished that idea that open throated music full throated music can happen only if you are singing akaram no in fact if you listen to his ragam you will find u s e s lu many, many syllables, syllables that are very unnatural to how to what we have been um, accustomed to accustomed to today but when you listen to him you will not say that he is not somebody who uh, does not sing with his full force of voice but his modulation is so precious um, and the fact that he um, kept the raga in mind meant that any syllable he sang was full of that raga and each time you heard a ragam with a different syllable that you weren't used to you got a different flavor a different color to that ragam that you would never get where it then i think for me especially showed the value of usage of different syllables that would then give you different pictures of the same ragam just like how different lyrics or different emotions can be conveyed through the ragam the same can be done through syllables as well right and just using a for the sake of sacrificing everything else is not more important than keeping the raga intact and i think that is something that is extremely important for us to get from his music because it is true that beyond a point he also had um certain changes that he went through with his voice because of which he had to make certain accommodations and the fact that he still made those accommodations without sacrificing on the raga so if that meant that he used different syllables if that meant he dropped his pace slightly if he dropped his pitch slightly the fact that all of this happened um in beautiful collaboration with one another where finally when he sang you didn't hear any of this you just heard music is i think the magic of his music and his understanding of his own music which i think is very important it is also said that he chose his shruti very carefully i've heard uh, stories where uh, they used to say apparently he used to say that uh, ideal shruti for uh, a musician would be where uh, they struggle just a little bit you know there's a little tension in the voice when they touch the tarasthai sajjam itself mm. and then beyond that there is a tension in the voice which kind of opens up your uh, mm. uh, throat so i I've, i've heard that he used to say that so he was very uh, conscious of um every movement and how he um even with the limitations that he had because of certain changes that he went through with those limitations how he didn't sacrifice the gamaka the movement of the swara the movement of the raga the phraseology and did not compromise on the throw of the voice on the expression of the voice because he changed you know the formants what we call formants he changed his formants when he sang with right. the syllables so that is something phenomenal yeah and one other thing that's very interesting to note is that when he sang uh when we talk about madhyama kalam in swaram singing that was very uh 
that was a kind of an underlying current throughout his music even if, even when he sang ragam for example you would find that um, each of the phrases that he sang would always fit within a meter and there would be certain sections that all followed certain meters there would be multiple kala pramanams within one ragam but there would be certain passages that fit into certain kala pramanams mm-hmm. and for a person who isn't thought of when you think of fast paced music or when you think of briga sangadis his madhyama kalam was to a point where it's neither slow nor fast but it's very difficult to reproduce in fact most of his uh, compositions the speed at which he sings sounds beautiful to us because he is extremely uh, comfortable singing it and everyone with playing along with him are extremely um, i think kind of anchored along with him mm-hmm. but if you try singing along with it even a simple song like uh say ma kelara or any song like that rama bhakti samrajyam that you know is seemingly simple you try singing along with it you try singing four avartanams of swaram you will realize how difficult it is to maintain that i think calm and composure in that pace and give it to you with that feel so i think that was something that was there in his ragam singing whether it was ragas like ravi chandrika or shuddha bangla or jayanta sena or those kind of ragams or even ragas like thodi bhairavi kalyani etc uh, there was a lot of calm there was a lot of composure and he was very settled in what he sang so that i think is beautiful in every aspect of his music so we will start looking at various different aspects more in detail let's first speak about his paatantara so when you uh, look at uh, his uh, paatantra the repertoire that he had he sang many uh, kirtans that were popularized by many of his peers and you know senior vidwans at that time uh, for example he sang chakri raja he sang tiruvadi charanam and uh, kolo yunade all these songs were popularized by stalwarts at that time but uh, there was something uh, unique about it when he sang it he had conviction in his own style the way he expressed the song the way he sang the song right and um, very interestingly when you listen to these songs you are more drawn to the way he sang naraval at a certain line or a way he sang swaram at a certain line or the way he expressed a certain word in that kirtanam and uh, interestingly for me i never looked at it as uh, a song that was popularized by somebody else or you know uh, that way but that version of chakkani raja sang by madhurmaniyar was special yeah. in itself the way yeah. he sang naraval at kantiki sundara was special in itself the way he enunciated the word kantiki the way he sang naraval the way he modulated the sangatis of karahara priya in that word was was something very madhurmaniyar about it and uh, that was very special in the way he sang kirtanams yeah no i think that's important for every musician right even if you're singing songs that are patented let's say hmm. by somebody else I think it's also a certain conditioning where today when people say Maru Balka, you think of Shemanguli. When you say uh, Raga Sudarasa, you think of G&B. Those are all, I think, things that have crept in today. But I think right. at that point, if you enjoyed singing the song, you just yes. went ahead and sang it. Because you knew that when you sang it, you're not going to sound like X or Y or Z. You, exactly. You're going to uh, sing it the way you feel like singing it. And I think that's the primary driving force for any of these musicians. Which is why when we hear them, each time, each of those compositions still remain fresh and relevant. one other Im- beautiful thing about him is also uh, the way he starts in concerts not every concert starts with a varnam or not every right. concert starts with say vatapi ganapatim or you know something else that was kind of the norm then but his paatantara was so rich that he could make a concert work by singing a song like oh jagadamba first or singing right. one of the navagraha kriti first. first just the kirtanam It's just the kirtanam yeah. there are recordings of him singing o jagadamba followed by just kirkala swaram for a good i think 7 8 minutes yeah. and that also shows that he kind of allowed his uh, knowledge of kirtanas and paatantara to also drive his concert structure and the sound of his concert rather than say a set format or a structure right Oh, my God. 
he also popularized uh, many hari krishna or mutya bhagavadar kirtanas uh, like you said he sang many dikshtar kirtanams like the navagra kriti is the kamalamba navarnams mm-hmm. and uh, it was not i mean he of course used to uh, elucidate uh, them in lot of detail with ragam nerval swaram but there were instances where he just began the concert with just the song or sang the song in the middle just to you know show the beauty of the song to kind of uh, yeah. experience that also and to still make you feel complete with just a rendering of the exactly Ketana. and it, it would be still same across recordings which means that there was a very strict patantara that he right there was a followed. certain uh, flow of sangati and the patantara yes of course that was there and uh, he also brought to the fore many uh, kirtanams um, so apparently he studied in a school that was started by hari krishna or mutya bhagavadar so uh, he has brought to the fore many kirtanams like uh, uh, sarasamukhi in gaudamala which is very famous the english note that he was so famous for there are also lesser known kirtanams i mean there is bhuvaneshwarya in mohana kalyani of course there are also uh, lesser known kirtanams like meena lochani amba in, in todi and uh, sahasra karamandite in vachaspati there are a few recordings of him yeah, singing yeah. these and he has sung them in detail with ragam nerval swaram so um and he also popularized many tamil songs he brought to the fore in his concert repertoire many tamil songs papana samshivan kirtanams uh, kanakan koti vendum and then you have uh, tiruvadi charanam gopal krishna bharati you have so many kirtanams that tamil kirtanams that he has uh, brought to the front wow. of course pamala as i first told in the beginning it which is a kirtanam on subramanya bharati sarasamukhi sakala bhagate it's also an exploration of the raga with the exploration of the syllable just the both of them together how beautifully it kind of uh, flowed together right it was not that he thought of uh, i mean i mean this is my analysis you wouldn't um, it is not that he thought of you know that the word was getting split at that syllable or uh, yeah. it was improper to do that at that point in time that it just flowed together with the music it was sometimes not even a syllable it was just an akaram that came after the pause when you had half an hour term left or one hour term left when you could pause at a certain point for example uh, raja raja vara was a pause it was not an extension of a syllable but that pause had a certain sangati like uh, development and progression actually if you look at recordings throughout also you will see a certain similarity in this progression of the way he sings this sangati is also definitely in fact in some recordings you will find that uh, the violin with one would expect it coming correct and would in fact played along almost like it was part of the patantara which is right. also interesting where then they would also anticipate it in other compositions where it's actually not there but then the pause would yield to that and they would end up playing it correct so that's a beautiful aspect one other thing we have to say about his patantaram is that it is never devoid of a kala pramana hmm. when you speak about someone's patantaram the kala pramanam at which they sing is as much part of the patantaram itself as are the sangadis and the progression right so one thing we have to keep in mind when we speak of madhuramaniya's kala pramanam is that he was not somebody who sang compositions like ho jagadamba or kamalamba extremely slow and sang compositions like ma janaki sarasa samadana extremely fast his bandwidth was not this wide his bandwidth was within this right so his mojagadamba was still much faster than anybody else you would hear singing the song 
But his Sarasa Zamadana and Mahajanaki was much slower than you would hear everyone else sing. Right. So his bandwidth was very tight. But within this short bandwidth, he would show multiple different uh, uh, variations of Kala Pramanam. I mean, if in today's parlance, if we were to say from 40 BPM to 120 BPM is what people think of. But his was probably 60 to 90. Right. Much shorter. But one song will be 60, the other will be 66, the other will be 72. But each of them will sound different because of how strictly he follows the Kala Pramana and how comfortable he is in that. And that also impacts the way we receive his Patantara. For me, the Ojagadamba, when I listened to it, the first time it was extremely fast because I sing it much slower. But for me, beyond a point, that Patantara grew on me purely because of the Kala Pramana, because of the speed at which he sang. And it worked so beautifully for his... Uh, Sangatis and for the way he sang the composition. So I think that's also important to keep in mind that the Kala Pramanam of the song you sing is as much part of the Patantra. Let's look at uh, a few more aspects of uh, his Manodharma from here on. Yeah. So let's look at Madhurmaniya's Raga singing or Raga Alapana. Um, one thing that will immediately strike you is that uh, the approach is very different from most other musicians. Uh, in the sense that you will not find him take one note, uh, sing around that note, sing a lot of carways around that note and build that note per se. Instead, what he does is he builds an idea. For example, if it's uh, So, that Padanidapa is the link to the progression from which the progression leads to something else. So his approach was in a way kind of permutation combination but within the realm of the ragam and what the raga also kind of allowed. He in fact found a lot of little pieces of magic in that. There are a couple of examples that I have right at the top of my head. When you listen to his Bahudari raga, mm. one very interesting thing that he does is he uses the logic that we use in Kamboji. Where if it is Padasa Sanidapa, we sing Padanidapa as a turn. So he uses the same in reverse because in Bahudari it is Padanisa Sanipa. So he uses Sanidanisa in reverse and it sounds beautiful. Until then I had never heard any other musician sing Sanidanisa and it was and it was almost part of that ragam in the way he sang it, with the flow of how he sang it. You will see many interesting uh, turns like that in Nalina Kanti. Mm. In his Nalina Kanti Ragam, you will find some very interesting usage of the Vakra Prayogam within the Ragam. There is also in fact one beautiful recording of his Bilahari Ragam where he will sing Sarigari Sanida, Sarigama Gari Sanida. So he will bypass the Sarigapa Magari Sanida into Sarigama Gari. Same as Padanida and Kamboji, the same logic will be used for Sarigama Gari. But the moment he sings Sarigama Gari, the violinist will play Sarigapa Magari Sanida. Mm. Almost as a kind of a way to say, okay, I don't know if I'm supposed to play it, but let me be safe and play Sarigapa. Then he will sing Sarigama again, again to let the violinist know, no, it's okay to, you know, sing that phrase. So, his, and for and for him to be able to do it at this Kala Pramana, the speed at which I'm saying the Swarams is the speed at which his phrases used to be. You would never find him sing phrases that had only two notes, where the ending note was a heavy Kampita Gamakam that was kind of exaggerated. No, his Kampita Gamakam Alavu was maybe one and a half, maximum two. <laughs>
and if you look at, look at again the syllables he used he uh, you will find a lot of uh, lu e u we a lot of beautiful syllables that sound magical when you listen um, to him singing uh, if i think i tried to do the same it would sound horrendous but i'm sure that there is space within each of our music to figure out which syllable works works for the tone and texture of our voice and i think it's only a matter of figuring that out for all you know some voices might sound even better with these syllables rather than the akar and it's only about figuring that out and i think a matter of uh, uh, trial and error which i think is a wonderful process to go through when you listen to musicians like this because they open so many more windows that you would never think of because you are immediately i think taught to sing only akaram and ragam so you don't even look at other possibilities because you are told that this is what you should do right. but when you listen to so many other interpretations you automatically then begin to explore all of that and i think that opens different windows into the ragam as well right of course just the way you enunciate a certain syllable or the way you sing a or u or v will open up another phrase for you because uh, in when you sing a there is no anchor point for a turn for example when you sing a sani dani sa or a padani da pa yeah. when you're singing only a you need to add another ha for a stress over there and when you sing a syllable like u or v or e uh, the, that that stress point for the turn is very is is very natural yeah. and no, that and opens up another phase. and also the stress points are there for every note right, right so each of those notes will have an equal stress point so it right. almost sounds like a, sounds like little spurts of rhythm right. actually when right. he sings raga right right and another uh, beautiful aspect of his raga development which i noticed when uh, there was there's like a 55 minute recording of mahajanaki in which he sang kambo ji alapna you notice that he takes an idea and uh, that idea is his is starting point is, is his anchor is his base idea from that he will develop a certain idea he'll go uh, suppose the ideas the ideas in the madhya style yeah. he'll develop it he'll go high he'll go to the dara style he'll come back he comes back to the same idea from that idea there is another branch of development with a completely new form of uh, yeah. phraseology and development and uh, approach yeah. then he comes again comes back to that idea from there he moves forward and then he goes to the sarjam and beautifully stands on the sarjam and yeah. goes on to the gandharam and especially yeah, no, actually he... something i have to say here is that in today's understanding of raga development we come to believe that thinking of raga through swarams is a bad thing yeah he is an example to show that you can think of swaras creatively even when you are using swaras as a mode to develop your ragam singing right and uh, there's a difference between thinking swaras and using that as a driving force in a raga like kambo ji and doing that for an already swara based ragam like nalina khan oh there's a big difference so when he sings nalina kanti he looks at the flavor of nalina kanti and uses the swara as a driving force Correct. as opposed to just using the swaras as a mode of uh, permutation and combination which will give him way more options so i think it's important to understand the spirit and the sound of the ragam first where at that point also exploring the raga through permutations and combinations of swaras only adds value to the ragam right. as opposed to it becoming almost like a Uh, diminishing factor and i think that understanding of raga is important for you to know how to use the swaram sin raga exactly swara based thinking when you speak about that the swara is not devoid of gamaka or right. the raga no no yeah yeah of course for example A combination based yeah thinking. for example i remember when i first tried singing uma varanam raga whenever i sang it it would sound only like janaranjani to my own ears gama pa pa mari would sound only like janaranjani but then the way he would shake that re slightly would give it the flavor of umabaranam umabaranam he wouldn't have to show the padanisa sanipa every single time to establish umabaranam just with the pamari he will tell you that it is umabaranam and not janaranjani or not any other raga with that gamaka exactly so which means that even for a supposedly scalar ragam like umabaranam how do you then re visit each and every one of those swarams and understand how much to shake that swaram how to shake that swaram and um what color that particular swaram takes in that raga for you to be able to bring it to life and i think that is a beautiful aspect of his music in so many of these ragams that he sang in fact i believe that he sang more of these kind of ragams than even 
say GNB or Ramnath Krishnan who are often attributed to having sung these um, Small, uh, uh, these so called smaller small scale are ragams madhur manier has done that in more expanse than the two of them in fact there's i think a 9 minute recording of him singing jayanta sena a 7 minute recording of uh, uma varanam Umar. a 10 minute recording of ravi chandrika but the moment you start playing it and he finishes it you will just be listening you wouldn't have known that it's a 10, 10 minute, minute raga alapana yeah. it would have flown by like that even gaudamalhar for example people don't i mean yeah. he's the one who brought that raga to the fore and he's he sung so i mean 10 minute alapana i think before yeah. sarasamukhi in that recording Yeah, he sang ragas like uh, Kapi Narayani, Uma Bharanam, of course, and uh, Saranga, Saraswati Manohari, not just uh, mm. Alapana, but Nerosara. Mm. We'll come to that a little later. But yeah, all these, I mean, I can imagine Atana, you Atana, listening Atana. to it right now. Yeah, but yeah. Atana, Pune Chandrika, uh, Bahudari, Saraswati Manohari, Sama, of Kamas. course, the Kamas, Mohanams, Mohan, etc., all of them as well, apart from the Todis, Bhairavis, Kalyanis, etc. Of course uh, one of the other ragams that is very interesting in his expansion two ragams actually are kanada and kapi yeah especially kapi as a ragam for somebody to sing that expansively i don't think was done before him if i'm not wrong because in most of the other recordings i find i don't uh, people have sung inta saukeya as a kirtanam or have expanded kapi in say virutams or something like that but i don't think before him anybody actually took that as say the center piece of the concert, concert and sang ex- and sang an extensive ragam for it followed by naraval and swaram and i think a kind of expanded the scope of what that ragam could be within the carnatic uh, world i think he did this for many ragams even through his uh, virtams for example behag sindhu bhairavi yeah. uh, Uh, Shadvida Margini, for example, I mean, there is a recording of him singing Swarams in Shadvida mm. Margini. I mean, all these ragams, to sing it expansively, I don't think was done before his time. Yeah. So, singing a Behag expansively, a Sindhu Bhairavi expansively, was something that he brought to the fore also. Yeah. So, let's now look at his uh, Tanam singing. there are not many recordings of uh, madhurmanayar singing tanam that we have in our collections but there are a few recordings there is one pallavi in todi uh, that he has sung tanam for i think anulol karuna before that he has yeah. sung tanam also there is a pallavi in uh, recording of a pallavi in kiravani that he has sung, sung tanam for yeah. there is one more in mohanam also uh, hmm. very cute pallavi sarasa dalanetra 
is the uh, pallavi and uh, i remember chowdey was on the violin and it was a beautiful exchange between the two of them with the tanam but they were all very short short bursts of tan <laughs> extensive tanums that i've heard was in these recordings and extensive as in not like 15 10 15 minute tanums the extensive itself was about 7 8 minutes of tanums about 3 or 4 rounds of tanum but in that tanum singing his uh, the beautiful way in which he used the tanum syllables was something that uh, i think yeah. we can learn from and uh, something that i noticed was uh, his phrase development in the tanum uh, was in madhyama kalam but then the development of the phrase the development of the pattern mm. came after he uses the tanam syllable mm. he used the tanam syllable to establish the kala pramanam establish that he is singing tanam mm. and then the fat uh, the patterns uh, the brika patterns or the progression patterns or the mm. arithmetic progression patterns the raga phrase based madhyama kala sangati tanam type sangati pattern development all of them came after the tanam after mm. the ta- usage of the tanam syllable right there are phrases where he has used the tanam syllable right. in these developments also then he ends them with beautifully by using the tanam syllable and goes on to uh, the next round mm. so that is something that i have uh, noticed so if you if you listen to just the tanam section in the middle maybe without the tanam syllable being used it may sound like he singing madhyama kalam sangathi is in the ragam right. over there right. but in context there was a beautiful uh, um, flow in which he flow. sang tanam from from the tanam syllable to the development yeah so that's interesting because we, because you're saying that when you listen to the tanam it sounds like a madhyama kalam raga phrase for me it sounds like is madhyama kalam swaram singing ha huh. quite uh, the opposite of that right. because right, right. because because for me i'm more also flowing along with the meter of that in fact it was listening to um, his swara singing that i felt that many of the compositions for which he sang, he sings swaram would fit beautifully after a tanam as well yeah because uh, because we often speak about the color of the raga alapana to suit the composition hmm. where let's say if we have to sing kolave unade you don't sing the very the ivatam very obviously but then you kind of maintain the flavor of that raga if also you sing the if, you sing, yeah, if you sing rave himagiri kumari then the speed of todi is lower you establish the da a lot more the jarus from the sa to da the various different ways of how you can sing the ni from the sa to da right. so similarly if you actually look at how we approach ragam or tanam for a pallavi since we are talking about tanam, tanam. singing before a pallavi the pallavi is only one line it doesn't have any specific um melodic mood. identity exactly as a composition where say throughout the course of a pallavi and a pallavi and charanam there is a flow of the ragam and there is a color of the ragam that you get by the end of the composition right so which means that more often than not you are kind of let loose to sing the ragam however you want and the tanam at whatever pace you want right sometimes when you are singing a nalakala pallavi and you sing a fast paced tanam for me that connection from that fast paced tanam to that slow nalakala is not always natural natural but in exploring the tanam before a composition like say kolave unade that is constantly madhyama kalam like say ma kelara uh, ma kelara or compositions like that you are also reinterpreting tanam 
in the way it was meant to be where it was called madhyama kalam in the olden day right and if you are singing a composition that's madhyama kalam after that and kind of singing swarams for the composition as well then from the time you begin the tanam you sing the composition and you sing the swaram the flow or the momentum is maintained throughout so is it better to sing a slow paced ravichandrika alapana and then sing a fast paced makelara or is it better to sing a tanam that goes along with makelara and then you sing swara i will just leave it open uh, <laughs> for people to think about because that is something that is so obvious in the way he sings because everything has a natural flow right. uh, and that flow is determined by the underlying sense of laya and kala pramana when we move into the nerval singing of madhuramani ayer i have a very interesting story to start this segment with um during one of the morning sessions uh, during the december season for lecture demonstrations uh, after one such session while i was um, traveling back to drop one of the presenters of the morning session it just so happened that on the radio was a concert of madhuramani ayer playing where he was singing tuki uh, atiruvadi followed by nerval and i'm sure as uh, many of you might have heard of that famous nerval the line that he picks is yetanayo piravi edutedutte ilaithe but he sings that line fully only for the first two times of singing that nerval in the pancham the violinist plays the line twice then the second round of nerval hits the sa straight and it is only yetanayo that you hear after that nothing else and both me and the senior musician musicologists uh, sitting with me enjoyed that entire uh, foray into shankara bharanam his flow it was mesmerizing we thoroughly enjoyed it and by the time i dropped her home at that point the recording had moved into uh, something else and we were still speaking about what we had heard and uh, she asked me a very interesting question she said okay fine the music was beautiful you know we listen to all of this but is this nerval so from a grammatical point of view in terms of ha, in terms of the rules of nerval we say you can't take too much liberty with the words the words have to maintain its position its alavu to a major extent each time you finish the line the words have to be complete the words have to finish within that one avartanam if it's a rupaka talam composition where the line comes across two avartanams you can't extend it to three all of these are rules that we are all taught as students but this actually led to a very interesting conversation for almost 20 to 30 minutes where it made me think about what nerval actually was is it important to maintain the rules and grammar of what the nerval is at sometimes the expense of what the line can offer many of the times we tend to um ha- force ourselves to i think stick to these guidelines where we miss opportunities that the line may sometimes give us and i think the fact that he looked at that word as a possibility is a very interesting way of looking at nerval because uh if he just enjoyed that word he could have sung that word as a separate viritam but the fact that it was in the presence and context of that composition along with rhythm along with the talam along with a meter along with uh, the fact that it followed the concept of that line and the line was used as a refrain to get back hmm. is i think a beautiful way of looking at nerval because he did this with multiple compositions if you look at taaye yashoda for example kalinil shilamb was just i think the phrase that he used and if you look at uh, saraswati manohari you will find him use only chintadi yeah sarasa samadana you will hear only hitav so in my opinion i understand the standpoint of looking at it through the prism of what a nerval should be but i think it's also important i think as a musician as, and as a student to think about the possibility of that line and what he derived from that line that prompted him to it's not like he didn't know the rules of nerval when you hmm. uh, listen to him sing nerval for narada muni or ninne nara namina nara or any of these compositions he followed it extremely strictly but there were some of these compositions and only in some of these lines that he took that liberty so 
it's beautiful that I think we also have this idea of looking at a Niraval as a possibility of exploring the Raga through certain words that act as a linchpin almost for that entire line. Where, in fact, I will go to the extent of saying that Tukhi Thiruvati as a composition, I think he finished the composition in less than a minute. Uh, I am happy to play the recording after this. The composition was done in one minute, not more than that. But the moment he got to this line, it was like everything else dissolved and it was only that one word that stood there. So, I think as a Neraval, this presents a wonderful opportunity for us to look at the idea of what we actually focus on when we sing Neraval. Is it the Ragam? Is it the line? Is it? Are we looking at the possibilities that different lines can give us, the different musical, uh, uh, what do I say, graphs that each line has and do we explore the graph or do we say, okay, I'll pick this line, it has a good, it has a good complete meaning and I will keep repeating this line over and over again. I think this is a very interesting point for us to, I think, think okay, about and ponder. <laughs> Another very interesting thing about his Nerval is, since I've heard Pama like so many times when I was a kid, um, Tamil Nadu, he'll just use that one word, he will sing a whole range of uh, Harikamboji using Tamil Nadu, just mm. the word in different different uh, ranges of the Ragam. But the most interesting uh, part was, when he's moving from one range of the Ragam to the other range, mm. he will use the line to move. Mm. So. If Tamil Nadu is sung around Pada, when he has to go to Sa or mm. Ga, he will use Tamil Nadu Saitava Payana Ivandavar and then go to Tamil Nadu over there and stand at Tamil Nadu and then explore the Ragam completely mm. with Tamil Nadu. So, that's, that's also something that uh, gives us a different dimension towards Nerval singing. Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu, 
ತಮಿಳಾಡು 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 and uh, when he sang that line when he sang the entire line hmm. while moving from one range to other it's not in the tune of the composition but the syllables will be in place hmm. the words will be in place and he will move there yeah but then he sees a certain spark in that syllable or in that word and uh, he uses it to develop for example kantiki sundara in in chakani raja yeah. he will just sing kantiki sundara that's, that's all, all. taramag roopame will come later on yeah or when he is moving to the other region of the raga yeah in fact this is when this is where i think i have to speak about artists like t n krishnan hmm. and bellu ramabhadran and pani subramanian pullai and so many other artists who played along with him for me i believe that i enjoy his music the most and i think it fits the best with t n krishnan and bellu ramabhadran that is my personal opinion <laughs> but it's just magical how uh, the music is elevated when you have artists on stage who understand the space of each other of course in fact when he is talking about kantiki sundara or tamil nadu uh, i was just thinking that most of these uh, one word naravals happen in adi tal and mm. and in a certain and at a certain gate and you will find invariably that if it's an artist like tm krishnan or an artist who really understands madhuramani ayer you will never feel silence but not having silence but keeping it enriched is a wonderful thing and of course with somebody like pani subramanian pulli or vellur ambadran you will have the continuous rhythm going that is almost the layer on which madhuramani ayer places all of his music yeah. so if he sings in tamil nadu till here the remaining would actually be the violinist filling, filling in, in. So most of the times i think repeating what madhuramani ayer sang almost like a mirror but many times uh understanding that they may not have the same amount of space so figuring out what to play within that space in that feel in that feel but something different that still complements and works with this and he would very beautifully understand this and lead his development from what the violinist has given him or from the change of the pattern of the mridangam many of the times when the mridangist is constantly playing one pattern and he stays in one region the moment the mridangist kind of hints at a change of a pattern he will also realize that he stayed there for a bit too long mm-hmm. of course we all get carried away as musicians we all want uh, that space where we just feel like we are floating and i feel that always in madhuramani ayer's music so mm-hmm. you will also find him take these small cues from other artists on stage to move the nerval to a different note or to keep it moving but i think it's the gait or the speed at which he sings that yields for this one swara um, sorry one word nerval which i think is a again a beautiful and unique facet of his nerval i i am sure that no other musician has done this at least from what yeah. we've listened to in all the recordings that we have no other musician but him has used just one word to explore the concept of nerval I mean I still remember I mean uh, Ritwik spoke about Tien Krishnan and Velu Rambadran I still remember one of the drives the long drives that Ritwik and I went to we just listened to that one recording of uh, Jayanta Sena <laughs> and uh, Vinata Sutava for I think 6 hours straight and we were just going on it was going on in loop and uh, yeah it's a beautiful uh, thing the way he takes his music uh, in that one gate in that one kala pramanam and the way the artists on stage the vidwans on stage also go along with him and understanding his music so beautifully uh, yeah. is 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 amazing yeah we have some examples here of course most yeah. of what we you spoke about I, everybody have heard i mean sarsa savadana of course ma janaki um, neravali raja raja yeah. or raja raja vara uh, tukke tirudi of course paamalai ninakundo uh, sita pati ramasana Sita Pati with just Prema, yeah. with just Prema, not even Prema Juchi, Napai, which is the halfway point, just yeah. Prema, just the first word. Chinta Deer Chita and Yenta Vedu Kuntur Agava and uh, yeah. Actually, actually it's interesting that Sita Pati, Yenta Vedu Kuntur Agava, Maa Janaki, Sarasa Samadhan oh, no, and all of these compositions are also Ondrada Kirtanams. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the reason why I specifically brought up the Ondrada Kirtanams is because of his exploration of swarams, swarams. and we will move into swarams uh, there 
um, he is somebody who didn't look at that six as a finishing point. Hmm. The way we are taught today and the way we sing swarams today is that the moment it's a wonder kirtanam, that six or that one after the beat as a five is used as a punch or a landing point to start get to that to point. get to the point where we are singing swaram. But for him, that's whether it's six after or four after or two after or the summum were all the same. So you would never find an unnecessary punch or a forced um, kind of pressured intonation for certain swarams to show you that he is landing there. He will right. land there when you least expect it. Right. But it will be the most beautiful because he is so uh, comfortable with the space, with the six and with the landing point that for him it is the same as singing 100 avartanams of swaram without having to finish or 101 avartanam swaram. Exactly. I mean, the he flow, enjoyed the yeah. he enjoyed the kala pramana. He enjoyed the space between each okay. I'm putting talam between each tattu, for example. That space between each tattu was just. I think. I think if I want to look into his mind, I think it was in slow motion. Yeah. And he could just expand in that space and uh, yeah. He there was no. I mean, singing swarams like he did was extremely difficult. I mean. Tried singing it and it's extremely difficult. He sang like Rifik said that Tadikita ko Raja Ra was was not there. He didn't looked at it that way. Yeah. But it was always a multiple of fours, multiple yeah. of twos, for example. Not actually. that that's a bad thing. Let me clarify. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a different approach, yes. But then the moment that approach is used as a means to subvert the natural flow of the swaram. Many of the times what we'll do is Raja Ra, then after that you know that there's so much where it'll be free flowing. But then the moment it comes, comes to the there. ending, whatever the flow is, we tend to disconnect from the flow to forcibly finish at that point. Right. Where you then, I think, subvert the idea of what Sarvalagu Swaram is. Mm. Uh, if that five flows naturally with what you are singing or that six flows naturally with what you are singing and you are able to link it beautifully, great. But it can't be at the expense of Sarvalagu and that is not something that he n- never did. Right, of course. And singing in fours, multiple of twos and fours, I think, is phenomenal the way he did it. Variety of swarams, hundred swarams, I mean, hundred avatarams of swarams, one avatarams of swarams. It will just keep going, keep flowing with a lot of variety, with a lot of ideas. And it's not just, there There will be instances where he just takes one swaram and sings a brika in it or sings a phrase yeah. in it or sings a certain gamakam in it. And it's, it's not a combination of different swarams. He didn't look at... For me, he didn't look at swaram singing as swaram singing, but he looked at it as as ragam singing. It was a part of ragam. There will be yeah. so many instances where he is singing swaram and then he just flies into an alapna over there. Right? He, he just flies into a short uh, alapna phrase singing and yeah. then gets back to the swaram in that same flow. So, um, yeah, no, I doing, think he does that yeah. and uh, mm. uh, cool. also, I mean, uh, actually, Ritwik uh, brought this to my notice once we were listening to Kolo Yunade. They keep singing Sarvalagus mm. Swarams for so many Avartanams, it just keeps going. Yeah. Nobody feels like stopping. No, I mean, I mean, for me, my theory there is that it's the flow. I mean, like, you know how once you, like, you know those days when you travel on a train, for example, <laughs> and there's a long stretch between two stations, you don't know how long it is, but then the train is moving at a constant momentum and you're just looking out the window and you don't realize time pass. Right. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what happens in many times when it's Madhuramani here along with somebody like T.N. Krishnan, Vellur Rambadran, mm-hmm. specifically in that recording that's, per yeah, se, exactly. where you get caught in this kind of continuum, where it's very difficult to get out of it without breaking it harshly. And you don't want to do it because you're enjoying that momentum, you're enjoying that flow. And uh, I mean, in today's understanding of Kalpana Swaram singing for Kolive Yunade by Ravi, you will sing a few one hour thanams, few two hour thanams. Then you will sing one big hour thanam swaram with one core vai, one punch, something to finish to get your applause. Then the violinist might do the same thing and then you finish. That's basically how we approach it today. But in that particular recording, uh, of course, with, with Madhuramaniyar, you never found any core ways to finish a big swaram. You wouldn't even know when he would finish the big swaram. But the impact would still be there. That was his magic. The beautiful thing about this particular recording is that he will first sing something that seems like a big swaram around pa, goes to sa and then finishes. But then he does that a lot. He doesn't, 
his periyaswaram is determined more by the flow rather than the range, range of how much he goes he doesn't start in the kirsa expands everywhere sings male re then goes up and then does one entire flourish and then finish that's not the way he sings his big swara for him if the raga is complete if he is able to give you the raga in just the panchama region of bhairavi within the mapadani range then he will just give you that as the big swara and finish so there in that particular recording that's the first round the second round he goes to sa sings another big swara finishes and then tn krishnan plays again then he sings around pa again between pa and sa goes down till re and then these are all long swarams they are not short by any means they are much longer than what we call long swarams today then he would finish and then give it back to tn krishnan and tn krishnan will actually play the continuation of the line <laughs> thinking that okay fine now after two big swarams three big swarams he may be done but no he will ask tn krishnan to play again tn krishnan will again play then madhuramaniya will sing another big swaram in re and ma just in those regions it's almost like uh, four parts of one big swara but each of them were complete in their own way and at no point were they disturbed at all because the driving factor for this continuum was the mridam we will play that specific recording now after this um, uh, explanation but his flow uh, in fact i have listened to this recording multiple times once focusing just on tn krishna in fact you should listen to this multiple times from all of their perspectives if you listen to it from just velu rambadran's perspective you will find that what seems so simple as an underlayer of rhythm has so much complexity so much variety so uh, so yes. many different combinations of what he does there are different ideas of four the same idea of four with just a change of modulation you will find that his volume will increase mm-hmm. when madhuramani ayer leaves a gap and tn krishnan is filling up the gap at that point his volume will increase when tn krishnan's gap is done he will decrease his volume and provide an entry for madhuramani ayer again all of this happens seamlessly and that was the magic of uh, understanding the mu- the music of people you share the stage with and it only elevates everyone's experience so when all of this is happening you will find that at some point then there's a fourth swaram that happens that madhuramani ayer again sings extensively and tn krishnan this time plays the entire line and waits hmm. but he is still asked to play again so he plays a very short round and then finishes with 5 5 5 5 5 and then takes the line 5 5 carve 5 5 carve 5 and then takes the line that flows beautifully with everything that they presented for so long but it is a disconnect from the flow that has been established and velur rambadran joins in beautifully and they both finish at that punch point and then both of them continue playing the line so it's almost like they both realize that for this to and someone had yeah, to, to put the brakes kind of intervene and say okay boss this is done you know we've spent a lot of time on this we need to at some point finish and that was such a wonderful moment i think where it, beyond that if you still try to keep the continuum alive it's already been disconnected and it's been consciously disconnected so at that point it's very difficult for you to resurrect what you've been feeling all that while and all three of them are sensitive to that where at that point then it just moves to the line of the song they finish the song and it's done <laughs> tava magari ga ma pada pada baba bani da bala mamma ni da bada baba tava da bala mamma ma pada baba tava ma da ba ma da ba ma ni da baba gari ga ma pada pada baba pada ni da ni da pa pada ni da ni da pa da ba ba pada ni da da pada ni da ri da 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 ri gari da ni da ba Dabba ba ba da ni da ri ga ri ri da ni da ba 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 da ni da ri ga ri ri da ni da ba 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 da ni da wa ri da da ba ni ni da ba ba ga ri da. Ga ri da ni ni da ba ga ri ri da ni da ba ba ga ri da wa ri ni da wa ri ri da ni da ba ba ga ri da. Ma ga ri ga ba ba da ba ba da ni da ba da ni da ri ba da ni da ri ri 
Sarvalagu singing that is so unique to Madhuramani Iyer's style of singing and the possibilities that arise within his singing of Sarvalagu Swaram. Yeah. Because, because when he said that, you know, he looks at it as Ragam. When you listen to even uh, with specificity to this recording of Koluva Yunnare, you will find that there are many phrases that you will never think of when you sing Swaram, if you are thinking of just the Swaram. If you are once, once, I mean, mentally we all have these things where the moment you sing Swaram, you switch on a different aspect of what you are looking at. Mm. Permutations, combinations, things that you would never do in a Ragam or a Nerval, but you would do those in Swaram. Right. So, which means that in many points, you will lose opportunities that present itself um, within Kalpana Swaram. Because you are looking at a different aspect and not focusing on the opportunity that the Raga gives you there. Right. But with Madhuramaniya, you, you will find some very, what seems like awkward, weird jumps from one note to the other. But they make complete sense when you look at them through the prism of Bhairavi as a Raga. Which is so beautiful because you know this person is singing so much Swaram, so much Sarvalagu Swaram. But is driven by the Raga. Completely. And this is something that you will find through this recording, you will find him uh, use the connection of the Pa and Re beautifully, and re. that Bhairavi gives you beautifully. And there would be space for Gari Sagari, six notes to finish. But knowing that the flow of what he sung, the Sagari seems like a force fit to fit the Aroanam, he will sing. Gari sa sari riga or Gari sari riga. So he actually knows that saga riga is bhairavi. He sings saga riga multiple other times. But for that flow, sari riga is more apt to the flow. Sa sariga also is so. Sa sariga because at that point for the flow of that ragam, that is what fits. Yeah. So the fact that when you are singing sarvalagu swaram in that kala pramanam in that flow. To still have Raga as the driving force under which you have layers of Swaram, layers of Rhythm, layers of Kala Pramanam, layers of Laya, layers of all of these different things happening between them. It's truly a magical experience to just be able to listen to this. Also, it's not just in Ragam like Bhairavi or Kamboji or Shankaravarnam. When you look at Ragams like Purna Chandrika, Saranga, Mahabharanam, Kapinarayani, the same thing happens. He sung the same expanse of Swarams. Uh, multiple avartanams, uh, Saraswati Manohari. So, uh, in all these so-called, you know, smaller range ragams where, where beyond a certain point you won't know what to yeah. sing. But yeah. then there is something beyond that, beyond a certain point, yeah. which he is looking at because he is looking at the ragam as, as, a, as an entity and not the swaram or the phrases that can be sung while you are singing swaram. Yeah. He, there are there are swarams where he is singing from sa to ma, sa to ri, tarastai sa to uh, yeah. madhyastai ri, tarastai sa to sa. 
and um, like pari diga gama ma and all that i mean yeah. it just keeps going beautifully the way he looks at the ragam the uses jarus uses brika sangeetis yeah. while singing swarams beautifully yeah. so uh, and of course the flow and i think it's amazing how um, artists with him on stage kind of went along with his laya yeah. and it is so beautifully apparent that he is also holding the yeah. laya and they are also beautifully holding the laya with him but for him invariably you will find the beginning and the ending speed are the same throughout there would have been so much nerval so much swaram so many interplays happening but the kala pramanam would have been maintained from beginning to end that is again something very unique to him and if you look at ragas like shuddha bangla for example you when you are when you begin to sing say swaras or uh, raga alapana for shuddha bangla you are told to not extend the ga too much because you can sound like darbar you can move into shri ragam maybe but most of what he sings is ri ga gari ri sa sa da so the ga has a carve but from the first phrase he sings there's a beautiful recording of him singing shuddha bangla ragam before rama bhakti and then singing swaram from that first phrase he will establish shuddha bangla so beautifully by the usage of that gandharam which is supposed to be in my opinion at least the trickiest swaram to handle in shuddha bangla because that's the swaram that is very easy for you to trip into other ragams right. but he uses that as the main center point to establish that ragam and the way he uses the sada drop is beautiful and he continues that sada drop when he sings uh, swarams for rama bhakti also so let's listen to that record <laughs>
there is one more very important aspect uh, while singing swarams like this, while singing kirtanams like this. I have tried it myself at home. Singing one rayada kirtanams one after the other in this kala pramanam and singing extensive swarams in this kala pramanam requires a lot of stamina. And to sing it open throated like that, breath control and stamina is, is a very essential part of singing, especially in that kala pramanam and one rayada kirtanams, which have a range of. Um, the range from Mantrastai to Tarastai and invariably the Anupalavi line will be in Tarastai, the Charnam line will also be in Tarastai and yeah. we are drawn towards singing there also. Singing there, becoming louder beyond a point, exactly. forcing it but you will never find him do any of that. It will be yeah. the same tone and uh, texture of the voice throughout. Throughout and, and that stamina with which he sings swarams, the mental stamina, the physical stamina of singing swarams and his mm. concerts were not short. They were Three hours, three, four hours, you know, and, and continuously doing yeah. this is, is phenomenal. Another more amazing part of his singing swarams is the Ragamalika swarams in Pallavis. Mm. I mean, I, I have enjoyed it. The two tapes that I had when I was young and after that listening to Madhuramaniyar collections that everyone shared with me. Beautiful swarams in Behag, beautiful swarams in Sindhu Bhairavi, beautiful swarams in Shadvida Margini, mm. beautiful swarams in... He would sing swarams in ragams like Ahiri, then, um, uh, you know, even Suddha Seemantani in one of the Ragamalika swarams. Yeah. And uh, beautifully, it'll, it'll, it'll just end with the swaram in Todi or Kamboji or whichever ragam he's singing, the Pallavi and Kiravani, Vachaspati and beautifully it'll just meld in and end. And uh, the most beautiful part is he would... Uh, he would sing his Ragamalika Swarams and then the violinist would play in, in this uh, recording of uh, mm. Dana Lola Karunala, he would have sung Sindhu Bhairavi mm. um, or am I mistaken, Parimala Rangapati, I think mm. he would have sung Sindhu Bhairavi, he would have sung Behag and uh, the violinist would have played uh, the Swarams for that also. He will pick from that mm. and then go on another tangent in the same yeah. Ragam and come back. Yeah, no, actually one thing that I have to mention here is that Whenever I listen to Madhuramaniya's music, I never sense a feeling of formality hmm. that you often feel with a lot of artists where you know the presentation was very formal. With Madhuramaniya, I can tell you that every time I feel like he got on stage and jammed. Yeah. Literally, with the people on stage. And you can feel that when he gets inspired by a phrase that a violinist is playing, he will begin to sing. And while the violinist is playing. While the violinist is playing, he will sing that phrase appreciate that phrase, sing it a couple of times, build on it, just sing a three or four ideas and then give it back to the violinist. Same happens in Swaram. He feels uh, motivated and inspired by the other artists on stage where at that point for him, the only thing that is driving him is the music and for him to want to participate in that experience. Not the fact that, oh, okay, my turn is done. This is the violinist's turn. I shouldn't, you know, interfere in that. No. At that point, if he feels he wants to... Uh, I think enjoy, contribute and also receive and learn and explore, then he is happy to do that. And I think that is important in us uh, looking at concerts as a coming together of three or four musicians with different identities where we are all there to share with each other and the people are coming there to experience it rather right. than it as a packaged, uh, what do I say, offering that is being given to the people who come to listen to it. I am sure that the people also enjoyed this spontaneity among them, which is there in abundance in Madhuramaniya's uh, yeah. concerts. And that kind of informality and the way he almost with a childish playfulness indulged with music is, I think, great. And I think that is a quality that none of us should lose uh, yeah. as we get older. Also, it's not just picking out phrases and uh, picking up inspiration from what the other artists have. Wait, even also the Jayantasena recording of Vinata Sutava, he would have beautifully uh, kind of influenced that Gamaka on the Gandharam while mm. uh, T. M. Stensar is playing uh, the Ragam. And uh, you know, he would also pick phrases from that and sing yeah. and he would also contribute. I mean, and, and Krishnan sir would pick from the Gandharam that he is yeah. uh, singing and play phrases from that. That beautiful exchange of music, it's, it's sheer sharing of music. Yeah. That is uh, something beautiful and I think all of us should kind of maintain that uh, spirit when yeah. we are
I think when you speak about Ragmalika Swarams and when you said Sindhu Bhairavi for example, it wasn't, it's also important to establish that over a period of time, Madhuru Maniyayar had established uh, certain markers in his music. Mm -hmm. Like for example, I know that when I sing Swaram for a Rupaka Thalam Kirtanam, that is Rendu Thalli, even if they are different Ragams, even if they are different Kala Pramanams, different approaches, there are some certain markers in my mind on how to approach that. Mm. Uh, that happens with practice. Every musician finds their own uh, approach to certain things. Like singing Mishra Chapu Moonitali Swaram, you have different takeoff points, or invariably you will find some musicians starting each round of Swaram after the violinist almost at the exact same spot. That happens subconsciously, but by uh, practice of what you are used to. One thing that strikes uh, you in Madhuramaniya's music is he had that with certain uh, compositions, certain ragams, certain swarams. Sure. Like every time when he sang Sukhi Evaro and Swaram, you knew that that after a few swarams, after enticing you, after making you wait, that Korapu at Ga will come. Yeah, of course. And before he sings the Ga, it will be a long swaram that will make you wait around pa and the audience will all be waiting. You can actually hear <gasps> from all of them, aha, you can hear the loud appreciation. Similarly in Sindhu Bhairavi, when he sings, mm, you will hear the audience roar literally. There are, there are many of these kind of things that he developed over a period of time as his trademark where it's all where it was almost not complete if he didn't sing it and every time he sang it was fresh <laughs> Every time he sang, it was beautiful. Like for example, uh, he would sing the Gama pa maga riga sa riga. He would sing that in Harikamboji, in Kamboji, in Shankarabaranam, in Charu Keshi, in so many of these ragams. He would, I think he sung it even in Saraswati Manohari, if I'm not wrong. Hmm. But every single time, the Gama pa maga riga sa riga would fit that ragam. And every time it would be enjoyed equally by everyone on stage, it would, it would be apt. There might have been two or three other opportunities where he could have sung it. But he will sing it at an opportunity where he feels is the most apt. And you will find the audience react to that. So I think that kind of also understanding what worked and what beyond a point he chose to keep and give to the audience again and again yeah. also shows his side as a performer and understanding that there were certain things that he figured out over time that he enjoyed doing over and over again. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. We all have certain, certain compositions phrases. that we keep going back to, certain phrases we keep going back to, certain ragas we keep going back to. And also Kirkala Swarams, I just uh, missed that. Yeah. Um, he sang beautiful Kirkala Swarams also. And he would sing Kirkala Swarams in Vandraya Kirtanams, hmm. which is extremely difficult. For example, the Chintajit, uh, um, 
ఆఫ్టర్ నెరవల్ హీ విల్ స్టార్ట్ కీడ్కాలేశ్వరం ఫర్ ఎంత వేడుకుంత రాఘవ అండ్ ద కీడ్కాలేశ్వరం విల్ బీ ఇన్ ద గేట్ ఇన్ ద ఫ్లో ఆఫ్ దాట్ కాల ప్రమాణం ద మోస్ట్ బ్యూటిఫుల్ పార్ట్ ఈస్ ద మేల్ కాలం ఆఫ్టర్ దాట్ వోంట్ సౌండ్ రష్ అట్ ఆల్ ఇట్ విల్ బీ అన్ ఎగ్జాక్ట్ డబుల్ ఆఫ్ దాట్ కీడ్కాలేశ్వరం i mean it, it was just beautiful there was no rushing there was no uh, in tamil we say otam there was no there was no otam at all the kirkalaswaram didn't seem too yeah. slow the melkalaswaram didn't seem too fast yeah. he did that for wonder yada kirtanams where it is extremely difficult to sing kirkalaswaram first of all and second of all to sing kirkalaswaram in fours and twos and sixes yeah. and not be conscious of that ending true actually in that same chintadeep chuta he would explore so many different varieties of landing there yeah the starting point is chintadi madasa he would the first varam would dani pa chintadi then mada chinta madasada then mada sari chinta then mada sari ga chinta so different facets of exploring a raga like saraswati manohar right. let's be frank it is a raga that's extremely tricky where the where the sadanipa madasa will definitely get you of course and especially in kir kalam where you don't have the extra four or five swarams in mail kalam that you have to adjust where you can do that exactly, and come exactly. Yeah. you have you have very limited space to play with and the moment you are expanding the ragam and expanding the line along with it the fact that he had seven or eight different finishing points finishing points in swarams not the way he finished on pa not right. five different finishing points for pa five different finishing notes itself and a way to get back to chintadeer chuta i think is also a wonderful example of how he looked at kirkala swaram as also being an expansion or an extension of that line and what that line could be salani patin tati chuta but then there are certain things right when he sings telisi ramachandra to namu or nijamar mavlanu or enta bhagyamu the charanam line i've noticed this the charanam line flows into the swara yeah right and adamodi galate for example mm. i mean that is another example of the one word naraval right. just in chadavulli chadavulli exactly mm. and and this it is just the even the kirkala swaram or the melkala swaram from the charnam line when he is singing the charnam word itself you will know that he is going to move into swaram from yeah. there right and uh, that is something beautiful i mean if we keep talking about his swaram singing i mean when we started by saying that he is known for his swaram singing and not just i mean we are not going to speak about only that but when we speak about his swaram singing there are so many aspects and we can keep on going about it uh, but another aspect of his uh, music is virtams he has sung uh, many virtams uh some of them uh, i don't think there are many recordings of a variety of rhythms of this but there are a few recordings of three or four rhythms mm-hmm. that he has sung in in multiple concerts repetitions for example veyu to veyu toli pangan he has sung it uh, many, times. many times in many concerts in many uh, uh, ragams in just one ragam in ragamalika then uh, there is one famous recording of etani vidangal than of tayu uh, manavar that he has sung and panne uh, nunakana again i found uh from the collection that i have i found one recording of him singing mm-hmm. panne nulakana and shlokam 
uh, he's uh, from what i have heard he uh, drove more towards tamil virtams shlokams there was one shlokam vaidehi saitam and there are a few more shlokams that he has mm. sung so um, even over there when you look at it he expands but there he does a very different thing actually he uh, uses the word the syllable of the word and the gamaka of the swara mm. and the ragam mm. Mm. to beautifully maneuver the word the music the melody and uh, right the virtham over there and uh, i'm sure i don't know whether he knew the meaning and everything but uh, if you look at the meaning of the words and if you look at the way he has uh, modulated the music over there it kind of fits very beautifully so that is something brilliant about and i think he's one of the earlier musicians along with a few of his peers to actually have sung so much virtham also yeah yeah ಯುರು ತೋಳಿ ಪಂಗಲ್ ಯುರು ಯುರು ತೋಳಿ ಪಂಗ ಬಿಡ ಮುಡ ಕಂಡ ಯುರು ತೋಳಿ ಪಂಗ seen different aspects of the music of uh, shri madhuri bani here in this session and uh, if we go on uh, the one thing that we can actually do is listen to many recordings and keep pointing out aspects that we have spoken about right now in yeah. each of the recordings in every recording you will find multiple points that we have spoken about coming together and um, somebody who is so aware of his music aware of his voice aware of his own kala pramanam aware of his limitations and kind of incorporated all of this in a beautiful uh, collaboration with his music and uh, with his personality is outstanding and something that uh, i think we can all learn from as students of music the way he conducted himself on stage from what we hear actually we kind of get to know that yeah. though we have not seen him yeah. he's always so gracious and magnanimous and spontaneous with his appreciation yeah. you feel right that it's a team working together and the fact that you can actually notice that while by hearing his music and not seeing it is something phenomenal yeah. and we should all i think uh, try and uh, imbibe that quality and you know uh, express that spirit while we are all singing so 
thank you so much for being with us uh, on this episode we had a great time listening to madhurmani recordings yeah. especially ritvik and i we have been on long trips we used to trip on just one song yeah. we used to go for one song and invariably people sitting with us in the car would really go nuts and be very angry because we'll be playing different versions of the same yeah. song from different concerts and you know trying and listening yeah. to them so no and i'm sure that it's happened with both of us where when we travel also on concerts with other friends of ours right. it doesn't happen with too many musicians but invariably with madhurmani here once you listen to one you want to keep that flow and that mood going so there's also that quality with this music one thing that is um, lovely for us i think to also acknowledge is that there are new facets and little things of his music that we still keep discovering every time every we time we listen to it right so none of what vignesh and i are sharing in any of these explore series are comprehensive and complete and uh, in any manner exhaustive there are multiple different layers to what each of these musicians have and we have our own biases and limitations through which we also listen to all of these artists so it it's also a process of understanding all of that opening your ears opening your mind opening your art to be able to receive from everything around you and i think acknowledging good where there is good and being open to receiving and i think that's the most uh, joyous thing to come out of this for vignesh and i where we really enjoy the process and it gives us more happiness to be able to find newer things that in some way we know in 10 years 15 years 20 years down the line will come back to us or or will get subconsciously incorporated into our music which we will realize sometime later mm-hmm. and that i think is the beauty of listening and having these discussions and conversations and i think diving into the music of all of these great artists thank you so much and uh, please stay tuned for the next episode of explore thank you thank you